blazing fires, raging adrenaline, and total anarchy, all within the walls of a federal prison. FBI tactical teams and negotiators work around the clock, trying to avoid a small-scale war and keep nearly 100 hostages alive. In the 1980s, the federal penitentiary in Atlanta housed some of the country's most notorious prisoners. 1,800 Cubans fleeing Castro's regime. 400 were hardened criminals. 200 were insane. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Castro called them undesirables. The U.S. government called them detainees. In 1987, they staged a bloody revolt. Now the FBI and special operations teams must infiltrate a burning prison to stop the violence before it rages out of control. Cuba, 1980. A plummeting economy and political unrest prompt Fidel Castro to allow Cuban citizens to leave the country. For the first time in history, the notorious dictator permits American boats to enter Cuba's Mariel Harbor. In a five-month period, over 120,000 undocumented refugees flee the country, heading for Florida. 2,700 are considered criminals or mentally ill under U.S. law. The Attorney General instructs the Bureau of Prisons to find space for them in America's already overcrowded prison system. 1,000 Cuban refugees are sent to the Federal Detention Center in Oakdale, Louisiana. Nearly 1,400 are transported to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. For seven years, the U.S. and Cuban governments negotiate to send the criminals and mentally ill refugees back to Cuba. On November 20th, 1987, the State Department strikes a treaty with Cuba. Over 2,700 Cuban detainees will be sent back. Within 24 hours, Cuban detainees in both prisons get news of the decision. In Oakdale, Louisiana, a thousand of them riot, taking 28 prison guards hostage. But at the Atlanta Penitentiary, all is quiet. Warden Joe Petrovsky, but there was a trust between the detainees and the correctional officers, and that trust was basically the treatment that the detainees got from the correctional officers. Early Monday morning, three days after the treaty is signed, prison employee Ted Manier arrives at work. He notices an eerie silence. There were hardly any inmates in the breakfast area. And normally it would be uh, full of inmates who were making a lot of noise and talking, and there was hardly anybody in there, so it was really quiet, unusually quiet. On the first floor of the prison industries building, detainees make mattresses. On the surface, it looks like business as usual. But in an instant, detainees overpower their guards and ignite fires. On the third floor of the industry's building, Manier and his supervisor oversee a furniture making shop. The riot spreads to the rest of the floors. It sounded like a roar, and it was coming up the stairwell.
they got the door down. And they just came running in. And they had these hoods over their head. Like they were made out of gray t-shirts or gray sweatshirts. And they just had holes poked out for their eyes so they could see. Manier tries to report the emergency, but he is attacked by one of the rioters. And I don't know if he was trying to hit me or just the telephone out of my hand. But he knocked the phone out of my hand that went across the room. Prison employees are facing their worst nightmare. Although they are well aware of the risks, they never thought it would happen to them. But we did realize there was a threat, but I guess you think you can control it. When you work with inmates, you get used to them, and sometimes you forget who they really are. The guards and factory workers are helpless. Unarmed and outnumbered, they face rioters carrying homemade weapons. The staff member notifies Warden Petrovsky of the crisis. Inside the wall, nobody carried weapons. The inmates always vastly outnumbered the staff. So if we had weapons in there, we could lose those weapons. The only weapons that we had was weapons in the tower. Petrovsky alerts the FBI and the prison's regional director. I try to give him an assessment of exactly what transpired and brought him up to date. As fire spreads throughout the industry's building, the detainees force the guards and employees into a tool cage and lock the door. We kind of thought that unless there's some miracle, that we would probably just burn up because there's no way to get out of one of the cages. The riot spreads throughout the entire penitentiary complex. Enraged detainees capture guards, taking keys as they take hostages. They begin to release the regular prison population from their cells. The riot is beyond containment. The detainees now control most of the central buildings. Rioters attempt to gain access to the main cell block, but guards lock down the sally port just in time. As flames and smoke engulf the massive prison complex, nearly 100 guards and employees are trapped inside. Built at the turn of the century, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is the largest penitentiary in the United States. It was a fortress inside that was surrounded by a wall. It raised from the ground approximately 40 feet, and the width on the top of the wall was approximately three uh, yards wide. So it was a massive, massive wall. The penitentiary is built on 300 acres of land with 28 acres of property inside the walls. Warden Petrovsky needs to figure out exactly where his people are located inside the complex. We had staff members in 11 towers that had very good observation over the entire outside compound who logged those employees that they recognized in those areas. We started a list of the officers that we thought were hostages. Ted Manier and his colleagues are trapped inside an equipment cage in the Burning Industries building. Several rioters try to convince the Cuban detainees guarding the cage to unlock the door. They were trying to uh, talk the guard into opening the door because they wanted to get us out and kill us or do whatever. So the guard had to tell them that they couldn't open the door and occasionally they would push one off for getting a little rassle. But the raging fire threatens to destroy the building. So the rioters are forced to move their hostages to another part of the prison complex.
The only route takes them across the yard in clear view of the towers. spots what he believes are detainees threatening prison employees. There was a guy that was up ahead of me, and he got hit. I, I remember seeing him. He was a Cuban. He got hit right behind the ear. One of the hostage takers is killed, and five others are wounded. I was getting worried because the bullets were going pretty close around where we were. Chaos reigns as guards and detainees run for cover. They ran us across to the corner of the building where they couldn't shoot at us. And that time they took us in the chapel. Detainees forced their hostages into a small room and locked them inside. Less than an hour after the riots begin, FBI agents from the Atlanta field office arrive at the penitentiary. The FBI has jurisdiction over criminal matters in all federal prisons. Warden Petrovsky briefs Weldon Kennedy, the special agent in charge. The first thing that I wanted to accomplish was to find out how many hostages had been taken, uh, how many might be injured, uh, what was the threat to those people who were, in fact, taken hostage. All of these people were like on an emotional high. I mean, they'd been prisoners for literally eight, 10 years, uh, some of them serving life sentences, and now they're free to roam around the prison. It was like a holiday. This is the area where they... Agent Leon Blakeney heads the Atlanta FBI SWAT team. Agent Blakeney appears in silhouette to protect his identity. Nobody really knew what area that the, uh, that the inmates controlled. And, they really didn't know how many hostages were taken. You had 2,500 people housed in that institution. Here's the administration. There were people running around uh, all over the place, and, and quite frankly, it was chaos. Chaos that had already turned deadly. As agents Kennedy and Blakeney developed their plan to retake the prison, they received critical intelligence from two sources from FBI agents posted outside the walls of the prison complex, and from prisoners inside the walls who don't want any part of the riot. We began to learn uh, who the hostages might be, where the detainees were holding up, uh, how many were there, uh, what kind of weapons they might have. The detainees have taken the guards' radios, compromising prison communications. Agents and guards switch to a secure frequency. Two white males and two black males. The situation is grim. Negotiations will be critical to resolving the standoff. Special Agent D. Rosario, an FBI negotiator, opens up a dialogue with the rioters. Unreasonable demands are being made the hostage takers want things done now. And that's why it is so important to try to bring them down to a level where they can be reasonable. Can you negotiate with people at that very high emotional level? Generally speaking, no. So we had to give it time. The rioters are emotionally charged angry over the shooting death of a detainee. This theme came up time and again. You killed one of ours. You had no reason to, and you killed him. And they wanted me to see the bodies. So I had the body brought out to where we were. I looked at the body. They wanted me to get emotionally involved with them. And these four that originally came out to talk to me really were only speaking for themselves. They were not speaking on behalf of the 1,400 that were in there. In the command post, Warden Petrovsky receives a frantic call from 16 employees who have barricaded themselves in cell block E. E block is home to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary's most dangerous criminals. 
these particular group of inmates were locked away and he used to keep them from harming someone. If the detainees get into cell block E and free the inmates, the lives of all 16 employees will be in danger. The E cell block is also home to the prison system's most notorious inmate, Thomas Silverstein. A number of people in the Bureau of Prisons told me that he singularly was the toughest prisoner they believed that the Bureau of Prisons had ever housed or had in their custody. He was just an absolute uh, animal. And he hated everything to do with uh, the Bureau of Prisons or any of their staff. Silverstein was incarcerated in 1975 for a bank robbery. Years later, he was sentenced to multiple life terms for fatally stabbing an inmate and a prison guard. Thomas Silverstein was cold and he was a killer. He had two things on his mind to escape from jail because his crimes were such where he was going to die in jail. Uh, and, and the other objective was to kill people. Uh, it was as simple as that. The guards in cell block E are in grave danger. Special Agent Kennedy works with the FBI SWAT team to come up with a plan to rescue them. The SWAT analysis was that they believed that they could go over the wall out of view of the rioting detainees and retrieve those people out of that building successfully. The SWAT team will need ladders to get over the 40-foot high wall. Special Agent Blakeney calls on the Atlanta Fire Department and a National Guard helicopter crew to help carry out the plan. We put a helicopter up uh, on the opposite side of the prison to attract their attention and uh, at least we have some diversion. Hey, Chief, here's the situation. We've got a hostage crisis. Seven hours after the riot began, the FBI SWAT team launches a daring mission to rescue 16 prison employees without endangering the lives of nearly 100 hostages. Seven hours after a riot breaks out at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, an FBI SWAT team launches a mission to rescue 16 employees barricaded in one of the prison's cell blocks. FBI Special Agent Weldon Kennedy knows that if the rescue attempt is seen by rioting Cuban detainees, it could spell disaster. They would not hesitate to kill hostages if it became apparent to them that we were going to try to retake the prison or retake any part of it. After scaling the wall, the FBI SWAT team approaches cell block E, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. SWAT rushes the prison employees out of the building. Keep your head down. Identify yourself when you get down there. Across the prison yard, 27 employees, afraid for their safety, have barricaded themselves inside the prison hospital. Frustrated, they watch as their colleagues are escorted to safety. FBI SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney. You know, they're screaming, frantic, you know, come and get us, come and get us. The director of the Bureau of Prisons urges the FBI SWAT team to go back for the hospital employees. The SWAT personnel informed me that there was a 100% probability that they would be detected going over the wall to try to effect the rescue of the hospital people. We can't protect the other hostages that are being held in other parts of the prison. And my concern was if, if in fact, we were observed then uh, they would start killing the other employees. Blakeney wants to rescue the hospital staff, but knows it's a risk he cannot afford. The detainees break into cell block E and release the inmates. Vicious criminals run free including Thomas Silverstein, a ruthless killer. As 
darkness falls, three buildings have been consumed by fire. Nearly 100 guards and employees have been taken hostage or have barricaded themselves inside the prison. Prison employee Ted Maneer is being held inside a room in the prison's chapel. So a man came up to the window, and he wasn't a Cuban. And the guy beside me said, that's Silverstein. And he came inside, and he had a flashlight, and he started shining his flashlight. He shined the light on me and said, don't I know you? And I told him, no. Oh. I said, I don't, I've never seen you before. And he said, you don't know who I am? He looked worse than anything I've ever seen in any type of movie or anything. And when you look at him, you know he isn't a normal. <laughs> There's something, something strange about him. Uh, he's really scary. Detainees finally distract Silverstein and he leaves without harming the hostages. On day two of the standoff, FBI tactical commander Danny Colson arrives at the prison. You could hear this huge roar. It was like a million bumblebees. You could almost feel the energy of those rioting prisoners. Colson started the FBI's hostage rescue team, an elite counterterrorism group in 1982. The HRT is law enforcement's equivalent to the Navy SEALs of the Army's Delta Force. The only unit in the United States that has a sophisticated explosive or thermal breaching capability is the FBI's hostage rescue team. But the HRT is already tied up handling the riot at Oakdale. So I was going to a, a very difficult tactical assignment without the team I was used to commanding. Despite not having the hostage rescue team available to him, Colson must still develop a full-scale tactical rescue plan. He faces several obstacles. A prison is built to keep bad guys in. You have barred doors, you have steel gates. Well, these same type of things keep a rescue force from getting in. I needed help from the military, primarily from the Delta Force. Delta Force is the Army's special operations unit, but using them at the prison would be illegal. The Posse Comitatus law was passed right after the Civil War, and that law prevents the military from being involved actively with their personnel in civil law enforcement. Barring approval from the White House, the FBI must rely solely on civilian law enforcement Weldon Kennedy assembles over 400 SWAT members at the prison. We had SWAT teams from all around the country, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, as well as, of course, the immediate uh, surrounding area. We figured that based on the capability we had, we were probably maybe an hour away from getting in to rescue the hostages. We were all concerned that, that, that they started killing hostages. We, we were helpless to get in there. And that's one of the reasons that, that D. Rosario and the other negotiators were working so hard to try to get somebody to talk to to calm the situation down. But the negotiations are not going well. None of the rioters D. Rosario has spoken with has enough power to influence the detainees. The negotiators need a different approach. We could be here for a very long time unless we come up with a group of people in there among the detainees that can speak basically for, if not all of them, for the majority. Rosario asks prison employees which detainees command the most respect. Files of these people were opened to us, and we looked at several of them, and we decided on five or six men. We went to the grading and called them by name. And they came to the grading. And we invited them to come over to our side 
and sit down at a table with us and talk with us. The detainees agree to talk with negotiators. And we began our first serious conversations in terms of how can we resolve this? What is it that you are looking for? The number one demand that they had was that ultimately the Immigration and Naturalization Service conduct individual hearings for each and every one of them to remain in the United States. It's a straightforward request. Osario agrees to pass it on to the Department of Justice. As the meeting ends, the negotiator uses a bit of psychology to help solidify the group's standing as leaders within the prison. We uh, decided to give these men the mail that had accumulated since before the riot began. In the penitentiary, daily mail is an important link to the outside world. They went back in there, and we could literally hear the shouting of glee uh, when these guys showed up with two bags full of mail. We believe it created in the minds of the others that these guys could get things done for them. And that's where it began. After that, we kept asking for the same men. Rosario is beginning to make progress, but negotiations go slowly. In the prison hospital, 27 trapped employees are out of time. Detainees are trying to break down the door of the hospital with a battering ram. The employees call Warden Petrovsky in the command center. Warden Petrovsky relays the information to Weldon Kennedy. Detainees could break through the hospital doors at any moment. We had 27 people in there, and there was concern that once the hospital was taken over, they might be injured or even killed. So the ram is going, we can hear it as a matter of fact, banging the metal doors of the prison. Bureau of Prison officials worry about what could happen if detainees get access to the drugs and narcotics stored in the hospital. Um, what about right here? Weldon Kennedy asks HRT Commander Danny Colson for a second assessment. I said, yeah, we can get him out. We can go over the wall. We can defend the area with the perimeter and slot him out over the walls and we're out of there. Colson's biggest concern is that the detainees are watching news coverage of the riots. Inmates were watching TV to see what we were doing as much as they could and they could very well believe that a rescue of the entire prison was underway, and then they could start executing the hostages. Hospital workers are moments away from becoming hostages, or worse. So here we have a huge dilemma. Do we go in and take those people out of the hospital and save them, or do we let them be taken hostage? Kennedy decides a rescue is too risky. My decision was, based on all the information that I had, we will not go for the rescue. I will not authorize the rescue. And when he went back in and announced it to the Bureau of Prisons, I remember one Bureau of Prisons official storming past me and looking at me and said, if those are FBI agents, you'd go get them. And I said, no, he wouldn't. Weldon Kennedy wonders if he has just signed a death warrant for 27 innocent people. For two days, a riot rages at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Dozens of Cuban detainees now control the prison. 27 Bureau of Prison employees are trapped in the prison hospital. Weldon Kennedy, special agent in charge of the FBI's Atlanta field office, makes a tough decision. If we entered the penitentiary, if we tried to retake it, there was a threat they were going to immediately kill them all. Kennedy decides not to launch a rescue mission. Two hours after the decision, communication is lost with the employees in the prison hospital. 
It's the warden. Pick up if you hear me. I knew that if anything happened to any one of those 27 people, that I would forever live with that uh, as being the person responsible. Guards stationed at the prison towers gather intelligence as detainees move hostages across the prison yard. One guard calls the FBI command post with a disturbing development. A group of detainees is dragging acetylene tanks into a basement where they can access the prison's utility tunnels. Danny Colson is the FBI's tactical commander at the scene. They might be able to bring those tanks to get enough of them underneath our command post where the tunnels ran and uh, cause an explosion which would have decimated the command post and maybe have allowed them to escape. Colson and the FBI SWAT team prepare to go down into the tunnels. The tunnels were, were designed for two purposes. One is that all the utilities went through the tunnels, the steam pipes, the electrical pipes, and they were big tunnels. There were also ventilation tunnels that uh, started uh, big enough for a man to walk in standing up and ended up uh, only a few inches uh, uh, high. Colson and SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney have no idea what they will encounter once they are inside. Prison maps aren't reliable, and communication with agents above ground is not possible. As the team makes their way through the underground maze of pipes, they encounter a group of detainees. Leon Blakeney. Once we got in the tunnels, we discovered then that, that in fact the Cubans were in there. And oftentimes we'd come in very close proximity to them. Uh, within 10 feet of them, there would be a bunch of them and we'd confront them. And fortunately, uh, every time they'd turn around and run. The SWAT team is unable to find the acetylene tanks in the vast underground system but they are convinced the detainees are exploring the tunnels for a possible escape route. We decided that the tunnel system was, was a real threat to the successful uh, resolution of, of the crisis. Ultimately, we were able to, to station uh, SWAT teams down there. The Chicago SWAT team handled one part of the tunnel system, and the Washington Field Office SWAT team handled another uh, part of the tunnel system. On day three of the standoff, Danny Colson receives intelligence from agents with high-powered binoculars positioned around the prison. The detainees have moved nearly all the hostages to a building known as the American Dorm. Colson begins to formulate a tactical rescue plan. What do you think they can mean? What can Outside the prison, crowds gather. Families of the hostages, the prison guards, and even the detainees wait for information about their loved ones. The media covers breaking news from the penitentiary. There was hundreds of media people there. There were networks, there was local TV. They established a tent city right across the street from the, from the prison. A single reporter and a simple error threatened to bring the standoff to a violent end. Special Agent D. Rosario. The New York SWAT team was coming off shift and the Chicago SWAT team was coming on shift, and they passed each other right at the steps of the administration building. And it looked impressive because there was two very large groups of armed men, all dressed in black. Local reporter in Atlanta uh, is watching this and sees these 40 or 50 men dressed in SWAT gear going up the front steps and jumps to the conclusion and says so on live TV that, well, there they go. Looks like the FBI is going to retake control of the prison. When the detainees see the media report, they take immediate action. They brought several hostages out to the yard. And for the benefit of, of our cameras so we could see them, they brought these hostages out and they poured gasoline over them, and then they took their cigarette lighters and began clicking, whilst literally screaming at us, if you want to assault us, go ahead. As soon as you do, we're setting fire to these men. Without knowing it, a young journalist may have just made a mistake that could cost the lives of nearly a hundred innocent people. 
At the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI agents negotiate with Cuban detainees who have taken over the prison. The lives of nearly 100 hostages hang in the balance. On day three of the standoff, a journalist's error ignites a crisis. FBI tactical commander Danny Colson. All along our negotiators have been telling the, the Cubans that, that we weren't coming in, that we wanted to negotiate and wanted them to surrender. And now a reporter is saying we're coming in. The erroneous media report makes Special Agent D. Rosario's job even tougher as he negotiates for the lives of the hostages. We had brought them down to such a, a reasonable level of emotion, and when they thought that the FBI was about to assault, they literally lost it. We came literally within a few heartbeats of losing the hostages right then and there. We sent everybody to what we call phase line green, which is the last position you are in before you do a rescue. It was like a spark that was uh, about to uh, ignite this terrible inferno of, of, uh, of energy we had built up there. I had to convince them that no such assault was going to take place and that, you know, if, if things were going so well and so positive, why wouldn't we even think about assaulting them? After three tense hours, the rioters agree to continue negotiations and spare the hostages. We're just lucky that our negotiators were able to calm them down and we didn't have any loss of life. For Colson, the close call is a warning sign that the standoff could explode into a full-scale riot with very little provocation. At the end of day three, he obtains presidential approval to deploy Delta Force in a civilian crisis. The special operations team arrives in Atlanta disguised as FBI agents. There were three things that I desperately needed from them. The first was their breaching capability. They had all the breaching capability that would be necessary to get back into that prison to do a dynamic rescue. They had the ability to use explosives to blow steel gores down or blow locks out. They had the ability to use thermal devices to cut in an instant through steel and cable. The second thing I wanted was their sniper capability. When we went into that prison, if we had to go in, I wanted the very best snipers I could find doing cover for my men as they went in. The other thing is they have tremendous medical capability. They travel with a complete hospital. Uh, they set up with the doctors, nurses, uh, emergency equipment, uh, the latest state-of-the-art everything. If Delta Force or FBI teams engage the detainees in combat, the military hospital is prepared to treat any injury. They can bring their doctors right in with us. They can pop a chest and do open heart surgery right there in the premises if necessary. For the next several days, Delta Force snipers keep the detainees under constant surveillance. The rioters are working 24 hours a day, making weapons by the thousands. There's all kinds of steel inside the, uh, the prison, and they're very resourceful with the equipment, the ground weapons and the spears. Each one of them must have had at least two weapons. Delta Force sets up surveillance cameras all over the complex to track the movement of the detainees. Agents look for ways to get closer to the areas where the hostages are being held. If the Cuban detainees decide to kill the hostages, the tactical team must be able to launch an assault on a moment's notice. We've got uh, two people guarding the American dorm. This is not something where you play a video game and after it's over, you hit your reset button and everybody's alive again. You're talking about the lives of human beings here, and you have a tremendous responsibility to try to get those people out. Colson and Blakeney go back into the tunnels underneath the prison. One of the tunnels leads to the prison's electrical room. It's located right outside the American dorm, where most of the hostages are held. We were literally uh, on the other side of the window from inmates that were uh, right, across, right across the walkway from where the hostages were being held. 
by doing that, we moved our response time from half an hour to 10 seconds. It was a tremendous, a tremendous leap in our capability at that point. With the FBI SWAT teams and Delta Force in place, they will be in a better position to protect the hostages if negotiations break down. Until they start harming a hostage, there's no reason for us to try to gain forcible entry to save these people. We therefore will wait as long as it takes. The rioters have enough food to survive for up to a year. The day after Thanksgiving, they erect a Christmas tree on the roof of the building. That was very disheartening to us. Maybe they didn't intend it psychologically to be that way. We interpret it as we are going to be here through Christmas. On day eight of the crisis, prison guards stationed in the tunnel hear the sound of a drill. One guard recognizes the voice of Thomas Silverstein the most vicious inmate in the federal prison system. They think Silverstein is searching for a way out. We knew he would absolutely kill a hostage if it, if he, if it would help him escape. Weldon Kennedy asks Danny Colson to go back into the tunnels to apprehend Silverstein. So we walked down the tunnel, and, and we did a tactical formation going down the tunnel, and we had lights on our weapons. Suddenly we noticed there was water on the floor, and then the water started getting deeper, and it was over the tops of our shoes, and then over our ankles, and up to our knees. Then what we finally realized is that that tunnel was actually flooded. The water flooding the tunnels had been dumped by National Guard helicopters to fight the fires. Looking further into the tunnel, he can see water fills it to the ceiling. He knows there is no way Thomas Silverstein can be in there. And what they were hearing was there were, there were tubes, ventilation tubes, that were above the water line. So the guards were actually hearing his voice, but we knew he wasn't going to get out. Still, Colson knows that Silverstein is as dangerous inside the prison as he is on the outside. He was a sociopath, and he'd already he'd proven he would commit murder. So had he done that, had he attempted to, to harm a guard or, or anybody else in there, uh, it would have caused us to have to go in and launch a rescue we didn't want to have to launch. And then again, we were faced with significant loss of life. Knowing Thomas Silverstein is such a dangerous wild card, FBI negotiator D. Rosario must convince the detainees to turn him over. United States, OK? I emphasized and kept re-emphasizing the fact that uh, Tommy Silverstein could become a very grave liability to the Cuban detainees and to their cause and to what they were trying to attain. I was told that uh, they would think about it. Rosario tells the rioters that until Silverstein is back behind bars, the hostages are in grave danger. As long as the vicious killer roams free, the standoff could come to a sudden and violent end. More than a week into the intense standoff with Cuban detainees at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI negotiators worry that a dangerous American prisoner could jeopardize a peaceful end to the conflict. What I suggested to them was that at some point or another, it would be in your best interest to turn Tommy Silverstein over to us. Special Agent D. Rosario tries to convince the rioters that Silverstein is a serious threat to prison employees who are being held hostage. The American inmate is jeopardizing their position in the negotiations. A short time later, a large group of detainees appears at the sally port gate of the main cell block. And there was about 100 Cubans screaming, waving their sabers in the air. And I could see they had Silverstein. And in the midst of all these screaming Cubans, they threw, literally threw Silverstein at us. 
Detainees tell agents how they captured Silverstein. So they gained access to the pharmacy. They took some narcotic. They put it in a can of a fruit cocktail, which he was known to like, and fed him fruit cocktail laced liberally with this drug, which in effect knocked him out. The FBI viewed Silverstein's capture as an act of good faith. That told us a lot. They don't want to hurt the hostages. It showed the negotiators that these Cubans were responsible. They were willing to do things to cooperate with us in order to reach a common goal, which is a, a great step in any negotiation process. On December 1st, a separate riot at Louisiana's Oakdale Penitentiary is resolved. The Cuban detainees incarcerated at Oakdale agree to release their hostages if the INS will review their cases. The government of the United States, through the voice of the Attorney General, told them, you know, it's not unreasonable to give you a hearing. D. Rosario offers the Atlanta detainees the same deal. Hostage takers have gotten exactly what they want, but still, negotiations stall. Audio surveillance reveals the rioters think the FBI will not use deadly force to remove them from the prison, that they would have a fighting chance to overpower federal forces. The Cubans thought that the FBI and uh, the other assets would come in with nightsticks and batons and just duke it out. The next day, Colson decides to send the hostage takers an indelible message. The detainee agrees to talk with Colson. And he said, I need to go to the restroom. So I said, wait right here. So I went around the barrier and I got the uh, Marshall's SOG team and the New York City SWAT team. I, I got them all up and I said, put on all your gear and line up along the walls and look mean. And he walked around that barricade and when he walked down that corridor, he literally jumped off the ground. I said, this is not gonna be a, a nightstick duel with your swords. We're gonna use deadly force. The rioters agree to the terms of the surrender. On day 12 of the standoff, the Cuban detainees release their hostages. I will never, ever forget those guys coming through that sally port and walking right by me and, and the look of relief. They were haggard and they were tired and they were worn out with this great sense of relief and they were all smiling ear to ear. When we finally walked out with hostages, not one of them having been harmed in any way. We regarded that as a huge success. After 12 intense days, the Atlanta prison riot is over. One of the most important things that sort of focused the American public on the plight of the Cubans. And um, I think that was important. They did have a story to tell. They just told it in the wrong way. After the riots, all detainees are granted an INS hearing. Some are released. Others with criminal records or mental disabilities are repatriated back to Cuba. The rest remain in prison. Seven inmates break out of a high security prison in New Mexico. State and local police call in the FBI. They begin a desperate search to find these dangerous men. The escapees, all violent criminals, threaten the public and terrify the community. Investigators must capture these men before they rob, rape, and kill again.
1987, the New Mexico Penitentiary housed hundreds of violent offenders, rapists, killers, men that juries put behind bars to protect society. On July 4th, seven of those men escaped. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It was one of the worst prison breaks police and the FBI had ever faced. For the innocent people caught in the prisoners' paths, it was the most terrifying ordeal of their lives. The North Unit at the Penitentiary of New Mexico outside Santa Fe is a level six facility. Open up B3. It houses some of the state's most violent offenders, armed robbers, rapists, and murderers. Convicted killer William Gilbert is the assigned janitor for his cell block. For Gilbert, July 4th, 1987 is Independence Day. He forces his way into the control room. Gilbert releases six other inmates. They join him in the control room. Inmates climb a ladder to an emergency hatch that leads to the roof. They take one of the guards with them as a hostage. The inmates walk along the roof searching for an exit. They are looking for a spot where the perimeter fence meets the building entrance so they can jump to the ground. Once they get down, they handcuff the guard to a fence and disappear into the night. The guard quickly frees himself and goes for help. Prison officials are stunned when they realize several dangerous inmates are now on the outside. Somehow, Gilbert got a gun inside the prison. He managed to get past the unit's security in less than two minutes. Because of budget cuts, there was no guard in the tower overlooking the roof area where the men escaped. Also, the security sensors on the roof were not functioning. The prison officials have no idea if the inmates were aware of this or if they just got lucky. The prison goes into lockdown. Officials begin a search of the immediate area around the prison. The escapees only have a 15 minute lead. The warden calls the New Mexico State Police. They want the roads sealed off and every officer on the lookout for the escaped convicts. Not certain how many escaped, guards conduct an emergency head count. They find seven inmates are missing from the North facility, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. Next, the entire prison is searched to determine if any of the escapees are still hiding within the prison complex. The seven men are nowhere to be found. Storage area is clear, going to second location. Local police and sheriff's departments are given the inmates' descriptions and warned to be on the lookout. Prison officials brief investigators from the New Mexico State Police. Former Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. We have to develop 
an investigative plan, a public notification plan, and an apprehension plan, and they all have to be working simultaneously. If we fail to do them in an appropriate manner or in a timely manner, the, res the results could be devastating. The prison is 14 miles from the heart of Santa Fe, and several residential areas are within a few miles of the complex. Investigators fear the inmates are desperate enough to resort to violence. The prison staff identifies the seven escapees. William Gilbert is a four-time killer. His death sentence was commuted to life in prison when New Mexico abolished the death penalty in 1986. James Kinslow is a serial rapist and killer. At the age of 22, he was sentenced to three life terms. David Gallegos is serving a sentence for armed robbery. Robert Davis is a former police officer turned armed robber. John Schmidt, Hector Torres, and Michael Romero are all violent criminals serving lengthy sentences. The New Mexico State Police assigned David Osuna as the case agent. I could hear the other people from the Department of Corrections saying, oh no, it's Jimmy Kinslow, oh no, it's William Wayne Gilbert, David Gallegos, probably the most notorious and dangerous individuals at the penitentiary of New Mexico. Deputy Warden Keith Norwood. They're serving life sentences. What do they have to lose if they are outside the perimeter fence and within the community? They had nothing to lose. <laughs> The time factor in, in catching a, an escapee is critical. You have 24, 48 hours to catch these individuals. After that, there's a good chance that they've gotten outside of your perimeter. As minutes turn to hours, state and local police expand the search area to a 10-mile radius around the prison. Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police at the time of the breakout. We went into each cell and brought out clothing from each of the escapees, and we sent them with the dog handler. And they would go out in the perimeter of the facility and start seeing if they could pick up a trail. The immediate need was to apprehend and recapture these individuals before they used any sort of violence against our citizens. The stress level for us in the law enforcement uh, arena was, was considerable. This was one of the most um, intensive searches that I've ever participated in. We had individuals on three-wheelers running around. We had people on horseback. I mean, if there was a way to search for, for these inmates, we'd look for it. The state police had a, a chopper flying around, and it had a flare with it. FLIR, forward-looking infrared, is a special camera mounted underneath the helicopter. With that flare, they were able to locate body heat off of the ground. Police helicopters coordinate with search teams on the ground. We could provide immediate response to any potential sightings. In the absence of sightings, we identified areas where we thought individuals could be uh, hiding out, conducted searches. We'd move tactical teams uh, into those areas to conduct foot searches. We had different teams starting a house-to-house -house search in the near areas of the uh, penitentiary. And then there were other teams that were following up on the leads, the people that were calling in, the suspicious people, what have you. Near the prison complex, canine units pick up the escapee's trail. They were able to maintain a scent trail until they crossed Interstate 25, and then they lost it. At the edge of the interstate, the trail stops cold. For law enforcement, it's an ominous sign. If they got a gun into the facility, then more than likely, they planned on a vehicle. To escape on foot here in New Mexico, it's kind of difficult because there's not a lot of water, there's a lot of cactus, there's snakes, there's just all kinds of stuff that run around here at night. Corrections Department, New Mexico State Police, the Sheriff's Department had a series of predetermined roadblock locations that in the event of an escape or an emergency would be manned in, in a certain order. 
Law enforcement expands the search area and calls in officers from all over New Mexico to man the vast network of roadblocks. Not only do we have the state police, but the city, Santa Fe City Police Department, Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department, we have different uh, tribal officers here. We have Tusuke, Pohuake, uh, San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, uh, Santo Domingo. I mean, these all encompass Santa Fe County. And then I believe that we also also pulled in officers that were currently in class at the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy. We basically had an inner perimeter of roadblocks and then an outer perimeter of roadblocks, just in the event that they somehow got past the first group. For law enforcement, the pressure is building. If these escaped killers are hiding out in the residential areas around the prison, no one is safe. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, seven men convicted of robbery, rape, and murder break out of a maximum security prison. Investigators suspect the mastermind is William Gilbert, a four-time murderer. Seven months before the escape, Gilbert had his death sentence commuted by the governor. When an inmate escapes, they're looking to get out and never come back. Former New Mexico State Police investigator David Osuna. They may do just about anything to keep from being apprehended again. And that includes uh, the possibility of murder. Authorities need to make the public aware of the danger. I've never heard of a correction officer being shot. And it was just my opinion that they'll shoot anybody to get away. The governor authorizes the use of the National Guard in the fugitive hunt and gives a shoot to kill order to police searching for the seven men. Investigators know that the physical search for the escapees is only part of their task. They need intelligence. Authorities pour over the fugitives' records. We're going to look at the segregation logs. We're going to see how many phone calls they've made. We're going to see who they've been associated themselves with. Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. The institutions keep volumes of records. Anyone on a visiting list, anyone that's come into the institution, when individuals were moved from cells, where they went during the day, can all be located in one form or fashion. It takes time, but you can find those records. Right now, it seems the escaped inmates have every advantage. These people have time on their side in terms of planning and strategizing and putting these things together. Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police. But as we know, the best conceivable plans always have something going wrong. So we were hoping for that human element to present itself. Investigators believe at least one other person must have helped the inmates escape. The weapon that the inmate had, how did it get into the facility to begin with? Could there have been another accomplice that maybe was employed through the correctional facility? We didn't know, but we knew that the weapon gained or entered into the facility somehow. They also suspect someone close to the inmates must be helping them now possibly family or friends. They're going to need to change their clothes. Uh, they're going to need food. They're going to need transportation. Um, they're going to need a means to communicate. We have to know early on if these inmates are going to contact somebody, who would it be? It doesn't take any sort of sophisticated analysis or evaluation to know that it's probably going to be family members that are going to step out on the limb and risk their own freedom to try to help out a loved one. That's kind of the common denominator and one that we're going to look at uh, immediately. Investigators compile extensive lists of people associated with the escapees. We wanted to know exactly who was visiting with who and to find out if maybe if it's another inmate that they showed particular interest in, maybe their family members. So we tried to expand that net as much as we could without depleting resources to the point where you reach the point of diminishing return. It's a huge undertaking. The FBI joins the search. <coughs> Former special agent in charge of the Albuquerque FBI office, William Brannan. What we can do is any out-of-state leads that are developed as a result of this investigation, 
Uh, no matter where they are in the country, we can have an FBI agent on scene within an hour or two to conduct the interview or to gather the information. At the prison, state police investigators question the inmates, but they have to do it carefully. Timing was very important when you interview inmates. It's a different world. Everybody's timing everybody else. They're watching. If you spend more time with one particular inmate than you do with somebody else, the first question they're going to ask, I wonder why. Did he divulge any information? And their life is on the line. We had a timer set up, the inmates would come in, we'd talk to them for 20 minutes, and regardless of where we were in the conversation, we'd send them back. The inmates of the North Unit say they were not aware of the escape plan. These guys kept that plan pretty confidential. And for inmates not to know things, what's going on, especially in their pod, that's pretty unusual. Investigators also questioned prison personnel. They learned that days before the breakout, guards confiscated copies of state police and prison radio codes from Robert Davis's cell. Hours after the escape, guards made another surprising discovery in Davis's cell. Aeronautical charts and maps of Mexico. Was that truly part of a plan to take a plane, to hijack a plane? to drive to Mexico? Or is it to send us off in a direction 180 degrees from where they're really at? We sent an officer over to the airport in Santa Fe. State police ask airport security to be on the lookout. Bob Davis, although he's an inmate at the facility, is a very intelligent individual. This was not an escape of opportunity. It was well planned. High-risk individuals, they were highly motivated. Investigators need help and appeal to the public. They want the local people to call in if they see one of these individuals. Police release the fugitives' mug shots and rap sheets to the press. And more importantly, they need to know how dangerous these individuals are so that they don't allow them in their houses, don't assist them in any way. They were our eyes and ears. They started airing footage on the history of each of the inmates. Thousands of calls overwhelmed police hotlines. Anybody who saw anything unusual in Santa Fe or within 40 miles of Santa Fe were calling the police departments or the Crime Stoppers hotline reporting suspicious or unusual activity. While investigators sort through tips, they work to close off every avenue for escape. Santa Fe was uh, completely locked down. I mean, uh, everybody from the governor on down was exceedingly concerned about this. Uh, the whole state of New Mexico was concerned about it. The residents of Santa Fe are terrified. Because they're constantly living in a state of fear that somebody might break into their house, somebody might cause harm to their family, somebody could be killed. It was just my opinion and the opinion of the investigators that these inmates were still in the Santa Fe area. We felt very strongly that they had not escaped our perimeters. Two days after the escape, a homeowner in Santa Fe reports a break-in at his house. Police find a prison jumpsuit. The find indicates that some or all of the inmates may still be in the Santa Fe area. Then on that same day, two miles from the penitentiary of New Mexico at a local racetrack. A security guard makes his rounds. A security guard who was on his toes saw this individual walking through the racetrack. Come here, come here, where are you going? Come on over here, sir. He confronted the individual and after a quick discussion realized this was probably one of our escapees. He was able to handcuff the guy, call local officials, New Mexico State Police identify the trespasser as Hector Torres, one of the seven escaped inmates. With one captured, there's always the possibility that the other ones are close by. One inmate has been found. Authorities dispatch a SWAT team to the racetrack to search for the other six convicts. If the other men are hiding at the track, police have them cornered. 
But that is when these men are most dangerous. Outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, seven convicts escape from a maximum security prison. One man is in custody, and SWAT teams search a racetrack complex for the other six escapees. There is no sign of the remaining fugitives. Investigators' only lead to their whereabouts is Hector Torres, the man they captured. Where are the rest of the guys? Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police. When we interviewed him, he said he walked for hours. Didn't know where he was going. Just continued walking and walking and walking. And uh, he said, before I knew it, and he was so fatigued, he was tired, he wound up back at the penitentiary. Torres claims he knew nothing about the escape before Gilbert plan? opened his cell. There was no plan. He just knew that he was free for the moment and took advantage of that. According to Torres, four inmates stuck together. Gilbert, Davis, Kinslow, and Gallegos. But the rest pretty much just scattered in different directions. Investigators suspect these four prisoners planned the escape. Gilbert only released Torres, Romero, and Schmidt to distract law enforcement. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. It was a pretty good thing to do as far as the ringleaders were concerned because they would put these people loose and out there and who didn't have a plan, who didn't know where they were going to go. This would certainly occupy law enforcement in running these individuals down. Three days after the escape, police believe six of the inmates are still somewhere near the Santa Fe area. Armed robber Michael Romero and violent offender John Schmidt, four-time murderer William Gilbert, armed robber and former cop Robert Davis, serial rapist James Kinslow, and robber David Gallegos. The men pose an incredible threat to the citizens in the area. There was no doubt in law enforcement mind that, uh, that there were going to be home invasions and that these people, they had to seek food, they had to seek shelter, and they had to seek transportation to get out of the area. On July 7th, authorities' worst fears are realized. In a suburb of Santa Fe, a teenager babysits her young cousin. She looked out the window and saw a man coming to the house. She was so paranoid, as everybody was in Santa Fe. She was able to call the police to, to say that somebody suspicious was approaching. One of those guys is trying to break in. Oh, no, he's trying to break into the window. Oh, no, no, he's at the door. He's at the door. Please come, hurry. Put the phone down. Please. Put the phone down. What do you want? What do you want? I need some food. I need some food. Come on. I need some food. Come on. Incredibly, the intruder only steals a bag of bread, then flees. Police arrive quickly. Investigators ask the teenager if she can identify her attacker. Former New Mexico State Police investigator David Osuna. This young lady identified David Gallegos as one of the escapees who broke into her house. SWAT teams converge on the area. Law enforcement officers searched every home within a mile radius during that time looking for the escapees. Gallegos and the other five fugitives are nowhere to be found. When you get a call like that, and the idea is that these inmates have broken into a home and they're taking clothes and food, that means they're trying to change their identity as an inmate. They're trying to uh, mix in with the general public and maybe go to a restaurant or do whatever some of the local people do. But they're looking for a way to get out of the Santa Fe County area. Stay close. The next day, there's another sighting. 85 miles south of Santa Fe, a highway patrol officer sees something strange on the back of a flatbed truck. 
when he pulls the truck over. Yo, let me see your hands. A man slowly. is hiding on the back. Slowly down, slowly. Come on down. Hands up. Get on the ground. Get your hands out in front of It is one of the escapees. Former police officer turned armed robber, Robert Davis. All right, tell me about New the Mexico phone. State Police questions Davis. What are you going to do for me? The interview with Bob right Davis now, like, was instrumental in breaking this case wide open. What Bob was able to tell us is how this plan developed from the initial stages all the way to the escape and where probably the other three important escapees were currently at. According to Davis, Gilbert, Kinslow, and Gallegos are hiding out together. As police suspected, a relative of David Gallegos is helping them. This relative was going to take him to a storage facility here in Santa Fe where they would be housed until the roadblocks were down, and then a relative of David Gallegos would once again meet them, bring them to Albuquerque, and they would make their escape all the way to California. Former New Mexico State Police Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. I think there was a sense from the investigative team and the management team that the information wasn't exact, but it was credible. Based on Davis's statement that the men planned to cross state lines, New Mexico State Police contact the FBI. Ultimately, I think the FBI found that there was enough information that the individuals might have left the state of New Mexico, then giving them federal jurisdiction. The FBI decided to file an unlawful flight to avoid confinement complaint. This is called a UFAC complaint. The FBI's UFAC casts a dragnet across the nation. Agents around the country are now on the lookout for the convicts. The manhunt intensifies. In New Mexico, investigators turn their attention to trying to find the storage unit. According to Davis, it was rented under a fake name and address. Agents and police search the records of every storage facility near the airport in Santa Fe. They check the names and addresses in the files, all of which are valid. Let me give you my card. The fact that we couldn't find Gilbert, Kinslow, or Gallegos indicated to us that they probably had some type of help and somebody was hiding them in the Santa Fe area. Agents and state police trying to find out who is helping the fugitives investigate the people closest to them. The FBI tracked them down, found their locations, determined what type of people they were, whether or not they could have been involved in assisting the people in the uh, prison break. And we eliminated a lot of these people as probably not having been involved, but we came up with a handful who we thought might have been involved. And among them was Gallegos' brother-in-law. The different agents, including myself, found themselves in Albuquerque a lot, interviewing members of the David Gallegos family. According to Gallegos' brother-in-law, he has not been contacted by the fugitives. He has no idea where they are. Investigators suspect he is lying. Several more days go by. The roadblocks stay up. Hundreds of officers continue to search for the remaining five fugitives. Even if it's true that three of the escapees are on their way to California, two remain somewhere in the Santa Fe area. July 11th, seven days since the breakout. A 17-year-old girl is house-sitting in an exclusive neighborhood. She has no idea she is not alone. Two gunmen suddenly appear. They demand the teenager's car keys. Come on, did he hear nothing? He see nothing. She notifies the Santa Fe police. As an officer responds to the scene, he spots two of the fugitives coming straight at him. 410 vehicle spotted in pursuit. The officer swerves just in time. Fugitives aren't so lucky. You would think that both of them would get hurt and injured because it was a good crash. It wasn't just like a little fender bender. Michael Romero was captured.
Prophet Schmidt is able to run from the scene. He's hiding somewhere in the neighborhood, possibly injured, and desperate to do whatever it takes to remain free. In New Mexico, three prison escapees have been recaptured. Four are still on the run. On the morning of July 11th, a Santa Fe resident notices a blood trail leading to his garage. He notifies police. The house is in the neighborhood where Michael Romero was arrested and John Schmidt disappeared the night before. Officers follow the trail of blood to the homeowner's garage. They find John Schmidt. This individual was uh, arrested in a garage near the governor's mansion in downtown Santa Fe, which caused a little bit of a stir. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. After the first four individuals had been apprehended, the only people on the loose were Gilbert, Kinslow, and Gallegos. They are the three most dangerous escapees. Four-time murderer William Gilbert, serial rapist James Kinslow, and robber David Gallegos. But nearly three weeks after the escape, the investigators are running out of time and money. Not only had the main players not been caught, but now we were looking at a great expense in keeping these roadblocks up and using the manpower that were available. So finally, a command decision was made, pull the roadblocks. David Osuna of the New Mexico State Police questions Robert Davis again. Davis sticks to his story. He was insistent that they're here in Santa Fe and that they're at a storage shed. You know, and, and obviously, I believe him. Agents and police continue following the only lead they have. So please step behind the vehicle. They take another look at all the storage facilities in the Santa Fe area. We finally end up at this one storage facility off of Airport Road. All right, ready? Let's go. Now! Nothing! At this facility, investigators find that several Nothing. people occupied one of the units for an extended period of time. Nothing. I didn't see Investigators find a tiny hole drilled through the concrete wall of the storage unit. And they could actually see, uh, although it was a very small hole, traffic going by, people going by, and talking, what have you. Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. The agents did check that particular location repeatedly, went through the records, but there were some cards that had been inadvertently stored in another file cabinet that were not provided to the agents on any of their visits. Again, we were that close. The discovery of the storage unit confirms the agent's suspicions that the fugitives are receiving outside help. We felt that someone had to have contact with that group. Investigators surveilled the remaining fugitives' family members. Former New Mexico State Police criminal investigator Carlos Maldonado. We use a technique where it's not aggressive, but it's obvious, obvious surveillance. Where they look out the window, they know that you're parked out there. Yeah, he's on the move right now. And it's to raise the stress level uh, so that hopefully mistakes are made. Agents set up pin registers a device that enables them to track the numbers of all incoming and outgoing calls on the phone lines of a select number of the fugitive's associates and family members. We had a pen register installed on a particular individual, and uh, on the 21st day, that individual received a call from a motel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We sent an FBI agent and a state police agent to that motel. I hope so. Hi, FBI agent. Um, they show the desk clerk photos of the remaining fugitives. 
Yeah, I have seen them. The desk clerk recognizes the three men. She says they checked out of the hotel a few minutes ago. Did you notice what that car there was? No. Police and FBI agents search the area. There is no sign of the fugitives. We recognize that we Wayne Gilbert and Jimmy Kinslow and David Gales had probably left the state. We didn't get any more tips, no phone calls, no nothing. Investigators believe California is a likely destination. They know Gallegos has relatives there. And recaptured escapee Robert Davis mentioned California. Authorities contact police agencies and FBI offices in California to be on the lookout for the three men. They believe the three fugitives are traveling together. Authorities most fear Jimmy Kinslow. They just knew or felt or believed that because of his background, being a stone-cold killer and rapist, that he was going to do that again. The FBI's fears are justified. In Arizona, Kinslow has already identified a victim. Seven inmates make a daring escape from prison. Only three escapees remain free. They are heading west, and one is taking hostages. Convicted murderer and rapist Jimmy Kinslow forces his way into an Arizona home. He demands to know if there are any guns inside. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. He obtained several handguns, a shotgun, and I believe four rifles. So now he's very highly armed. He forces the entire family into the car. Kinslow orders the father to drive from Flagstaff to Barstow, California, a 350-mile trip. In Barstow, he holds the family hostage in a motel room. Three hours later, he leaves the motel. He takes the couple's 11-year-old daughter with him. He leaves in their car with the 11-year-old and leaves the area. The mother and father are able to free themselves from their being tied up. Get the police, quick. Oh, hurry, please. They notify the Barstow Police Department. Barstow Police immediately contact the FBI. He's got my little girl. The FBI responded uh, to the area and began looking for the car that uh, Kinslow was using. Former special agent in charge of the Los Angeles FBI office, Bucky Cox. The fact that Kinslow now uh, was on the loose with an 11-year-old girl notches this up considerably. Uh, there, there is no type of case in law enforcement that gets law enforcement's attention more than the possible harm to a child. Agents and police searched the streets looking for the abducted family's van. Two hours later, they get an incredible break. The 11-year-old girl approaches a police car in Garden Grove, California, 115 miles from Barstow. All right, hold on a second. Step back. She tells the police officer she was abducted in Flagstaff, Arizona, by an escaped convict along with the rest of her family. What's happening? The kidnapper drove her around for several hours before dropping her off behind a restaurant. And says to her, you stay here, I'm gonna come back. If you're gone, I'll find you. Well, as soon as he left, she disobeyed that order and walked out to the street and flagged down a patrol car. She gives police an accurate description of Jimmy Kinslow. According to the girl, the kidnapper is still driving her father's car. 
she tells them she overheard him making plans to meet friends at a trailer park somewhere nearby. Garden Grove police spread out and searched the area looking for the abducted family's car. They quickly spot it. Garden Grove didn't approach that vehicle. They backed off of it to establish the surveillance to see if they could catch someone coming to that vehicle. They backed off in such a manner as not to tip anybody off that they were in the area and had any interest in that vehicle. An FBI SWAT team sets up a forward command post in a strip mall two blocks from the trailer park. We didn't want to be in a position where we could be observed by anyone who might be going to that vehicle or have anything to do with that vehicle. Garden Grove detectives maintained surveillance on the van. All of a sudden, an excited voice came across the radio. The lights are on in the van, and, he's, and it's fired up. I mean, somebody had started the van, turned the lights on, and seconds later, the van is moving. It's rolling. It's backing up. They pull out in pursuit. Investigators thought the vehicle was empty. Apparently, Kinsler was inside all along. The convicted murderer and rapist is finally in their sights. The FBI had to make a decision. Did they want to follow the car, see where it took them to, to try to capture Gilbert and Gallegos, or should they immediately arrest Kinslow? They made the absolute correct decision and decided to immediately take down Kinslow. FBI agents and Garden Grove police converge on all four sides of the vehicle. He's got a van in front of him. He's got uh, FBI behind him. I think there's a Garden Grove patrol car behind him. Put your hands up. Your hands up. I'm actually coming the opposite way and turn in towards the side, so he has no place to go at this point. Kinslow is outmanned and outgunned. But police fear this ruthless murderer will not go down without a fight. In Garden Grove, California, agents and police have dangerous fugitive Jimmy Kinslow cornered. Investigators fear they are in for a fight. Let me see your hand! Let me see your hand! Jimmy Kinslow finally gives up. Yeah. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to have an attorney. You can't afford one. One will be appointed for you. Investigators search the fugitive's car and make a chilling discovery. Former special agent in charge of the Los Angeles FBI office, Bucky Cox. We looked down, and there was a 357 Magnum pistol revolver that was laying on the floorboard on the driver's side. Investigators find additional weapons in the back of the vehicle. Kinslow is interrogated at the Garden Grove Police Station. Agents need to know where the remaining two fugitives are. Okay. The, more you help the us police the turn up the pressure. The fire Although Kinslow has nothing to lose, he starts to talk. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. There's no honor among these guys. Kinslow's told us where Gilbert and Gallegos were. According to Kinslow, the last two fugitives are staying at a motel in Garden Grove, California. He doesn't know the room number, but he can describe the room's location. Kinslow agrees to draw a sketch of the motel and of the room. And then he also tells us that another family member is there that had helped uh, Gallegos and Gilbert and actually brought them to the motel. Gilbert and Gallegos are on the second floor. The family member is in the room directly beneath them. From their command post two blocks from the motel, the FBI decides whether to raid the rooms. The fugitives are armed. They have nothing to lose, and 
and the motel is full of innocent people. That's a sketch that I drew based on information. Something. We could get, in law enforcement terms, burned. They'll, they'll spot us, and now we've got a really a dangerous situation on our hands. Conversely, if we hit the wrong room, then it's going to wake up the whole neighborhood, and we've got a dangerous situation on our hands. So we weighed the options. It's a risky operation, but losing the fugitives is even riskier. The FBI decides to raid the motel rooms. So here we had two separate rooms, one where the remaining two escapees from New Mexico are located, and the other one where the people who assisted or facilitated the escape are staying. Let's do this thing. So what we decided is we are going to do a SWAT entry on the room with the two fugitives, and we are going to do basically a knock and announce on the room down below as soon as the flashbang goes off. At 6.30 a.m., an FBI SWAT team forcibly enters room 243 at the motel. No knock was made. The device called the flashbang was thrown in. It immediately disorients whoever is in the room. William Gilbert and David Gallegos are quickly taken into custody. Don't move! Inside the motel room, agents find two sawed-off shotguns and a revolver, along with a large quantity of ammunition. I think once these uh, three individuals got to the motel, they probably figured that uh, they had pulled it off and that they were going to get off scot-free. But not so, because technology and law enforcement caught up with them. All seven fugitives are finally back in custody. It was an exhilarating experience when they were caught because the team had done their job. It was great. On July 31st, 27 days after the escape, the last of the fugitives are returned to the penitentiary of New Mexico. Their breakout had been months in planning. To this day, no one knows how Gilbert got a gun inside the prison. After the escape, New Mexico built a new prison with more modern security features. Thanks to the hard work of the New Mexico law enforcement agencies and the FBI, Michael Romero, Robert Davis, John Schmidt, and Hector Torres face additional charges. William Gilbert, Jimmy Kinslow, and David Gallegos will spend the rest of their lives in prison.